Hi, and welcome to the final week of our class and one of our final topics. We've been looking at the history of science, the history of technology, and we've been trying to take a look at the effects of the history of science upon society. Yeah? As we move into our final week, one of the issues we might want to consider is whether or not one of the effects of the scientific revolution and the growth of technology has been that human beings have actually created a new geologic time period. This is what is known as the Anthropocene. We've been looking at some, uh, some controversies about technology in this final week, and this is yet another controversy associated with the world in which we live today. So this is a PowerPoint it's put together by Dr. Jamie Finling. He and I have taught this class together before, and he, of course, is a philosopher interested in a lot of the, the way that we think about science and the way that we think about how science interrelates with society, and he is very interested in issues of uh, the environment, issues of the uh, role that science plays today in our everyday lives, right? So um, this work is called Monsters of the Anthropocene, Comments on a Man-Made World, and Bruno Latour, I Love Your Monsters. Uh, so you have two essays to read for, that go along with this PowerPoint. So let's start first with the article in The Economist about a man-made world. It's the cover story from May 2011, so it's a few years back now, but it helped to introduce the concept of the Anthropocene to the general public. This is, uh, if you break it down into the Greek, essentially what we're looking at is a term that says human beings are influencing the Earth, the Anthropocene, a man-made world. While not perfect, the term has stuck around. And here we have a nice scale of geologic time. Uh, we are here down at the bottom, as you can see at the very end. This is our epoch or epoch, the Holocene. Uh, it began at the end of the last ice age. And this, uh, if you go way back in time, helps us to understand the history of the Earth. You may be very familiar with the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, right? Um, but uh, this, we don't do a lot of attention to the Holocene in geologic time because it's it's here where we are right now. So a long period of time in millions of years, right? So um, millions of years. So this geologic time scale, there's an international commission on stratigraphy that has the responsibility for managing this time scale. Stratigraphy. Stratigraphy, uh, the study of strata, the study of layers. So um, I have some passing familiarity with, with archaeology, and archaeology certainly is um, the study of layers, but it's almost all human living layers. I don't get nearly into the core studies that some of these geologists do. So, um, so stratigraphy, studying stratigraphy. So there's an international commission on this. For the first time ever, there has been a question about the present. We've always talked about the past. How do you divide these different uh, layers into time periods, right? Officially, we are now in the Holocene epoch. Uh, this began after the last ice age, and it's marked by stable, moderate climate. But many, though not all geologists, argue that human beings are now the most significant force driving conditions on the planet, and that the name of our current epoch should be changed to reflect that, and thus be called the Anthropocene. So is human activity a planetary force? We've been looking at things like Copernicus and Newton and Einstein. Is human activity a planetary force? Is it shaping the planet? The article concisely summarizes evidence for recognizing human activity as a geological force. They point to specifically urbanization, so building of cities, massive city building, extensive domestication of plants and animals, 
These are things we've been talking about since the beginning of this class, that it's really gone into higher gear than ever before. Not only domestication, but relocation of plants and animals. What does that mean? Um, well, I don't know if you've seen pictures of Wichita that are, say, oh, from the turn of the century, the 20th century. If you see pictures of Wichita from, oh, the 1920s, we do actually have them. We have some aerial overhead views. Not a tree in sight. Not a tree in sight. If you get a now an aerial view of Wichita, we are green. We are covered in trees. That's because we relocated them here. We, we grew them here, right? A lot of them. There are cottonwoods are native. But for the most part, all the trees that we have here are brought in. They're, they're imported. We like trees. We like trees to be around us in our neighborhoods and in our parks. So we have relocated animals. Uh, the horse was not native to Wichita, if you can imagine. The horse was not native to, the, to Kansas until the Spanish brought it here. So we have moved animals and plants and other things into this region that the natural world didn't put here. Right? And, and so we're changing things. It's very interesting to consider that. Um, another thing that the Economist article points to is a, there's been a major spike in the rate of extinctions, both plant and animal. And that could be indicative of something. Is that because of human intervention? Or is it something else? And especially, they point to our alteration of carbon and nitrogen cycles. You want to take a look at that. This gives some very interesting examples of that from algae to, um, to others. So take a look. More importantly, the article discusses the significance of the central claim. In short, do humans officially change the geologic time scale? Are we in the Anthropocene? The other article you have to read is by Bruno Latour, and it's called Love Your Monsters. Bruno Latour was born in 1947. He is currently working uh, as a philosopher, a sociologist. He's worked extensively on the intersection of science, technology, and society. His essay, Love Your Monsters, was published in 2012, uh, and it's published by a group called the Breakthrough Institute. So, they like to stir up some controversies. They do. So, uh, so he's being published. The Economist is a very um, highbrow uh, journal. The Breakthrough Institute, a little different. He used to controversy. Mainstream environmental thinking has long been skeptical of technology and capitalism as solutions to ecological crises. This is seen by emphasis on ideas like sustainability, renewability, and, quote, getting back to nature, right? So there has been some ideas. Should we use technology to address our environmental issues? Should we allow capitalism to create solutions, right, for um, ecological crises? Um, or should there be other approaches? But others appoint point to the human costs of slowing down progress, especially for those in the developing world. So should we slow down um, dam building and bridge building and highway making um, in the developing world, particularly in areas of, in Africa, um, Asia, Latin America, where it's difficult to get um, good medicines to people because there aren't good roads, right? Uh, but every time you put in a road, you're changing the environment and perhaps even uh, leading a, a species to extinction. Who knows what we're doing, right? So um, how do we cope with the changes being brought to the world through human intervention, through industrialism, through all the things we mentioned, urbanization, um, domestication of plants and animals, and how that changes things, how we're dealing with our water supply, right? So how do we fix those things when we know that they're not the best they can be, right? Um, and should, if we do halt some of the progress associated with these activities, might we then be hurting those who are just now coming to embrace them? So very controversial. So can we love our Frankensteins? Latour points out that Dr. Frankenstein's big mistake was not that he created a monster, that he refused to care for it. 
This may have been the conclusion that many of you guys came to in this class. As the monster himself eloquently says, misery made me a fiend. Right? So was the monster himself evil or was it the neglect of his creator that made him violent? Latour's point is simple. We too have an obligation to care for our creations, meaning our technologies. Whether it is nuclear power or genetically modified organisms, we need to face up to what we have made. Not all technologies are good, but the mere fact that things don't always work as planned is no reason to give up on them. And if you recall from your Jared Diamond essay, absolutely. We often find extraordinary developments from technologies that just didn't work out the way we thought they were, right? We, we turned them into something new. So all technologies, not all technologies are good, but the mere fact that these things don't always work as planned is really no reason to give up on them. Latour introduces the idea of compositionism. Compositionism. And it might be a little tough to get wrap your head around, but try give us a give a shot. It's not it's not that hard once you get into it. Above all, Latour believes we should abandon our modernist dreams of a perfect solution, a perfect technology that just works and that will emancipate us from our limits. There are no perfect solutions. Instead, we should embrace our imperfect, mixed up, messy world, so full of compromises and unintended consequences. Latour gives this, uh, gives this attitude, which he contrasts with modernism, the ugly name, as Finling says, of compositionism. That there's a lot of stuff that goes into the world in which we live today. It's mixed up, it's messy, it's imperfect, lots of compromises, and a lot of unintended com consequences. Where modernist thinking is utopian, that there could be a great technology that, that solves all problems, right? Hoping for an idyllic future that is free of all unwanted consequences, compositionists are pragmatic expecting the unexpected, expecting that there's going to be a mess up. Uh, they are not surprised when the monsters they have built turn out to be ugly, turn out to be poor, poorly behaved. But instead of thoughtlessly destroying them, they attend to them, they work with them, they try to make them better. In short, they love them. So what if Victor Frankenstein had tended to his creature? What might he have discovered then? What might have changed? So compositionism. The world is imperfect. Uh, new technologies can be messy. Where the world is full of compromises and unintended consequences. We've got to care for our creation, but we've also got to care for those technologies that we unleash upon creation. Right? Latour ends with a powerful comparison that evokes Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. If you've not read that, take a look. It's very interesting, very inspirational. Rather than imitating Frankenstein, who abandoned his creation, we should seek to emulate God, who continually loves and cares for his creation, regardless of how imperfect and flawed it turns out to be. So we have to care for our creation, the creation that was bequeathed to us, right, as Pope Francis would, would offer, but also those elements within creation that we have created ourselves. We have to care for, no matter how imperfect and in flaw, or flawed it turns out to be.